The approach to causal inference that we've talked about so far is often called the reduced form approach to causal inference. It's built on the logic of the randomized controlled experiment, and it uses control groups to create the counterfactual and thereby confront the fundamental problem of causal inference. But it turns out that we can't always use this reduced form approach. In order to use it, we have to identify a treatment group and a control group. We can do that by running an experiment or by finding a natural experiment in the data. And if they are confounders, using the tools of econometrics to adjust for the impact of those confounders as we derive the average treatment effect that would have occurred had we been able to run the randomized controlled experiment. But we have to be able to identify a treatment group and a control group. What if the treatment is a unique event in history? When we first talked about the fundamental problem of causal inference, we motivated it with the assassination of John F. Kennedy and the hypothesis that some historians have made that this assassination of Kennedy caused our involvement in the Vietnam War. Now how do historians go about making that argument? They can't use the reduced form approach to causal inference. There is no treatment or control group. So instead historians go back into the historical record. They read everything that Kennedy wrote. They listen to all of his speeches. They analyze the way Kennedy made decisions. They talk to his advisors or read what they wrote. And they form in their minds a model of how Kennedy made decisions. They then ask, what decisions would Kennedy have made that would be different from those that Lyndon Johnson made had Kennedy not been assassinated? And they use that model to try to ascertain whether those decisions that Kennedy would have made would have caused us to be involved in the war in Vietnam. What historians are using is what we call a structural approach to causal inference. We're using what we call a structural model to derive the counterfactual. So the structural approach uses a model, what we call a structural model, to derive the counterfactual. Now historians will typically use verbal reasoning to create that counterfactual. Scientists and economists will typically use mathematical models to create the counterfactual. Think for example about climate change. The important question in climate change, aside from just the description of how the climate is changing, is how much is human activity contributing to climate change? So when climate scientists confront that question, they can't use a reduced form approach. There is no treatment group and control group. We don't have a set of planets where on some planets there's human activity and on other planets that look similar there isn't human activity. We have a single planet that's impacted by the treatment of human activity. So what climate scientists do is they create a model of the climate. They use all the information they have available to them, they construct all the processes that climate goes through as it's changing, how particulates in the air and the atmosphere affect climate in different ways, and they try to arrive at a model that accurately predicts what's actually been happening with human activity. Once we're comfortable that we have a good model that predicts well, we can take that mathematical model put it on the computer and dial it back in time, go back to 1950, go back to 1800, and rerun the model, but this time exclude human activity. So by rerunning the model without human activity, climate scientists create the counterfactual. What would the climate look like today had there not been human activity contributing to climate change? We can then compare the prediction of that model without human activity to what the climate actually looks like today to determine how much of climate change is due to human activity. Or think about macroeconomics. In macroeconomics, 
we often look at unique events in macroeconomic history. Macroeconomists deal with the economy as a whole, and they ask questions about what different policies might have done to an economy. Economies like the US economy are relatively unique. They change over time, and there aren't many other economies that are roughly similar to the US economy. So suppose that we want to ascertain how much of an impact a stimulus program following, say, the Great Recession of 2008 had on the economy, on outcomes like unemployment or GDP. So can we use a reduced form approach? Well, we don't have a treatment group and a control group. The last time any event like the Great Recession happened in US history was the Great Depression, when the US economy was very different. So what macroeconomists do is they create a model of the US economy. They try to use all the information we have, all the best thinking within economics, to try to structure that model and try to find a model that accurately predicts macroeconomic changes. Then we can look back at 2008 and rerun the model, just like the climate scientists did, but take the stimulus program that the government passed after the re recession started and see what would have happened to unemployment or to GDP had the stimulus not been put in place. So again, we're creating a counterfactual to see what the causal impact of the stimulus program on unemployment and GDP was, at least within the context of this model. The COVID recession was a similar unique event. And again, stimulus programs were passed by government, and we might look back and ask, what was the impact of those stimulus programs on important outcomes like unemployment and GDP? Again, we can use a structural model to do that to create the counterfactual. Or we can even use those models to make predictions about future stimulus programs. What would the impact be if we hit another recession of passing a stimulus program of a certain size? So macroeconomists, just like climate scientists, use models to create the counterfactuals when they think about the impact of big macroeconomic policies that are relatively unique events in economic history. Or you could think of policies that have never been tried before. Suppose that we think of a large healthcare reform. A healthcare reform that hasn't been tried before. We can't create a treatment and a control group to think about what the impact, the causal impact of that reform would be on important outcomes like changes in the healthcare market, health outcomes of individuals, the number of uninsured people, and so forth. So how could we go about it? Well, again, economists might construct a model of the healthcare market that includes all the best information that we have, that predicts well what's been happening so far, and then run the model with the new healthcare reform to see what the model predicts would be the outcome of the healthcare reform. So that's the underlying uh, logic of the structural model, of the structural approach. We use a model to construct the counterfactual, just as in the reduced form approach, we use control groups to construct the counterfactual. Now there's a place for each of those approaches depending on what it is that we're trying to analyze. And oftentimes the two approaches are used together. Evidence from reduced form approaches to causal inference often informs how we construct structural models that we use for a structural approach to causal inference. Each approach has drawbacks or advantages or disadvantages. And in each approach, there's a critical question that we would have to ask to think about whether we believe the causal inference analysis. In the reduced form approach, the important question to ask is whether there were any confounders that haven't been taken account into account in the analysis. In the structural approach, the important question to ask is whether the model, the structural model that's used to create the counterfactual, is rich enough 
to actually create a believable counterfactual that we can use for causal inference.